Hey, this is the coaching video for the on-campus small groups that are going to be teaching this lesson on Sunday, uh, November the 10th. So if you're an on-campus small group leader and you're going to be uh, leading or teaching, facilitating on November the 10th, you're in the right place. Now, as always, what you're going to need is a couple of things. Uh, one is going to need about 15 minutes or so of time where we can kind of uh, teach our way, walk our way through uh, the transcript for this Sunday. Then you're also going to need uh, the transcript itself, and you should have already received that. It should have been emailed to you, but that printed out, get that in front of you, uh, so you're ready to uh, to uh, use that to maybe make some notes on uh, as we go through this time together. Now, this Sunday we're starting a new sermon series. We're calling it Songs and Sayings, and so the lessons that you're going to be uh, teaching over the next several weeks are going to be those lessons that complement, that kind of tie in together with those messages that you're going to hear on Sunday. And it's been a great thing to, to for our small groups to be able to do that. Uh, we've seen that throughout the Gospel of John. It's brought some continuity, some consistency, and so that we're focusing in every Sunday uh, on, on the same uh, subject, on the, on the same text, and really helping drive home the points that God is uh, teaching us and the things He wants to use in our life to change us. And so we're going to keep on doing that and continue doing that uh, in the days ahead in our small groups. And so this is kind of the next phase of that or stage of that as we move into this new sermon series. Now, uh, the passage today that we're going to be focusing in on our small groups is in Mark chapter 8, verse 27 through 30. So if you get your Bible, go ahead and open up to that, that page. Get your transcript in front of, or that passage. Get your transcript in front of you, and let's get ready to kind of walk our way through it. Uh, now, as always, the first page is always kind of an overview, an overview of the lesson, kind of give you, you know, the bird's eye view of things and kind of see what we're doing uh, in this lesson or the direction we're heading in. And I think it's very important that you spend some time uh, look not only reading that overview, but thinking through it, because it's going to deal with where we're going to be in this lesson, going to be challenge every one of us to ask a very, very important question. And the question is, how do we see Jesus? Not so much as how do we see Jesus in regards to his humanity, his deity, but how do we see Jesus in regards to us personally uh, as our, our Savior, as our Lord, as our King? And how we view Jesus is oftentimes going to be determined how we approach Jesus. So it's going to be very important that we look at that and get that question answered for us uh, this morning. And, and here's what we're going to be doing. We're going to be basically zeroing in on this concept of how do we see Jesus or how do we view Jesus uh, in regards to, is he the end result of, of, of what we're focusing in on? Or do we see Jesus just as a means to an end result? In other words, is it all about us or is it about Jesus? And is Jesus just a way to get what we want in the way we want it? Or do we see Jesus as who he is, our Lord, as our King, that it is all about him? And uh, th that's going to be a very important thing for us to think through as we go through this text and, and seeing that he is the ultimate goal in our life. He's just not a means to an end. In other words, he's, he is the end. He's not the means to the end of that which we're seeking or wanting. Now, and get that overview kind of kind of nailed down because that's going to help guide you through all of this lesson. Uh, page two has to do with the introduction. And the introduction basically asks, uh, is you, uh, you are able to introduce this, uh, uh, met, uh, lesson. <laughs> I'll get it out in a sec. Get it this lesson by asking a question. And the question is this. Have you ever caught someone in the act of trying to take advantage of you or trying to use you as a means to an end? If so, what was your reaction to that? And probably every one of us can answer, yeah, we've been in that spot before. And, and here's what you want to focus on. Then how did that make you feel? And basically the bottom line is it makes you feel like you're being used by somebody. You're not very valuable to them. You're only valuable to them as long as you're helping them get what they want to, to reach their goal or achieve their purpose or accomplish uh, what it is that, that they're trying to accomplish. You're valuable to them as long as you're helping them get what they want. And unfortunately for many of us, that can be the way we see Jesus. We see Jesus as just a means to getting what we want. And we're going to be challenged to rethink that and challenged to refocus that as we go through our passage here today. Now, for those of you who will be teaching during the 1030 hour, of course, your, your time is always following the message. 
And in your introduction, it's going to be important that you kind of help people take what they heard and learned in that 9 o'clock hour and begin to think that through together as you go through your time. So notice the uh, teaching tip that's there for you, uh, some good stuff there for you and good stuff for you to use in helping get your lesson uh, moving in your small group. Now, page three is when we move into teaching the text. So let's just go ahead and jump into that. Mark chapter eight is our passage. And uh, the uh, teaching the text section begins with some really important background uh, information. I encourage you to take some time to study through that, to look through that, uh, because it raises some uh, very important uh, information to help you as you're walking your, your small group uh, through this text. And pay special attention to the sense that, or to the, to the information that mentions that the background here is in uh, Caesarea Philippi, which was a place that there was a lot of false worship taking place. And there was some false gods that were being presented in this particular area. And that's the area where Jesus asked this question. And you might want to try to uh, make a connection there with that in regards to these false gods uh, that the folks that were involved in the worship of them, all of their worship was, was basically the same. It was trying to appease these false gods to either get something from them or to keep them from doing something to them. And the end result was them. So this false worship was about using this, this false god to get something for themselves or to keep something from happening to themselves. And with that kind of background that we find Jesus asking a very important question of his followers then, and it's a question that all of us need to an answer as well. And it's basically the answer uh, question was, uh, who do people say that I am? Uh, Jesus came to his disciples and he asked them that question. You notice in verse 20, 27, he said, who do people say I am? In other words, on the streets right now, what is the word on the street about me? What are people saying about who I am? Uh, what's the public opinion polls saying about, about uh, saying concerning the, who I am, uh, the person that I am? What are, what are people thinking? What are people talking about? Uh, what's the general consensus out there? And as the, uh, Jesus asked that question of the disciples, they respond with, basically, with three answers. One, they say, well, some people say you're John the Baptist. Some people say uh, you're Elijah that's come back from the dead. And then others say, well, you're uh, one of the Old Testament prophets. So here's basically what was happening. They, in their answers, they were saying, well, you're either, some people saying you're, the, you're John the Baptist resurrected, are you a reincarnation of the Old Testament prophet Elijah? Or you're carrying out the role of an Old Testament prophet. You're kind of a prophet, but you're doing the role of an Old Testament prophet. And in that answer, basically what they were saying was a couple of things. And, and your, te and your uh, transcript points this out. Number one, they were basically, the word on the street was that Jesus was just a man. Now, he was a unique man, no doubt, but he was just a man. Like John the Baptist, he was considered to be one of the greatest men alive. In fact, Jesus called him that. Elijah. Elijah was an amazing Old Testament prophet that everybody uh, revered and uh, had great uh, affection for uh, in the Hebrew people. The stories about Elijah were known by everybody. You know, he was the prophet that de defeated all the all the uh, uh, false prophets of Baal and and all of that. So so you know that that he was um, that, that Jesus is kind of the reincarnation of Elijah, that uh, Old Testament prophet who did all those wonderful miraculous things. Or he was an old, just carrying out the role of an Old Testament prophet, a man who God would have uh, put his hand on to use to speak forth his word and think about it. And the Old Testament prophet was basically did two things. He spoke the word of God and he called the people to repentance. So that, that's kind of the word on the street was Jesus in that way. And tied into that is the second point that you see. It says they saw Jesus a precursor for something greater to come. In other words, they saw Jesus as the way or the means to better days than what they were having right now. They saw him as someone who is going to make life better for them, make 
circumstances different, make situations different. They saw him as someone who was going to uh, change the way of life that they were having to go through now, so it would be a better way of life in the days ahead. And without being so obvious, I'm just going to go ahead and say it. Basically what they saw Jesus, they saw him as a means to an end for better days for themselves. And again, the focus was upon themselves, not upon Jesus. Well, as Jesus uh, asked that question, gets that information back from the disciples, uh, he, follow, he has a follow-up question. And the follow-up question uh, you'll see is in verse 29, where he says, well, what about you? Who do you say that I am? And you'll notice that your transcript makes a very important uh, point here that the emphasis of this question in the original language was, a, was upon those particular disciples. Who? Who do you say I am? Now, this is what everybody else is saying, but who? You guys, who do you say that I am? And he obviously wanted them to think through that question for themselves. And uh, as you read through the text, you see that Peter, again, is one of the spokesmen for the group. He kind of steps up and he gives the answer uh, that, uh, that they probably all, they all have been talking about. Uh, they've probably been discussing this among themselves. And he steps up and he gives the answer. And his answer is, you are the Christ. Or, uh, in other words, you are the Messiah. And Matthew kind of gives us a little bit more uh, uh, extended answer. There, Matthew says that Peter further explains it, or Matthew further explains it, where, where, where he says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. So there was not only uh, speaking about Jesus' Messiahship, but also that he is God himself. He's the Son of God, uh, uh, speaking of the deity of Jesus Christ. Now, take note of, of that little teaching tip there called Did You Know? That's a really important uh teaching tip there. I think it'll be helpful, and uh, it can also, uh, you can use that kind of in a humorous way to drive home a point that all of us need to be reminded about. Um, and, and in answering that question, Peter was, and speaking for those disciples, was beginning to come to grips with the fact that it was not about them, but it was about Jesus, about who he is that he was to be, he is the answer. He's not the means to an answer, but he is the answer. He's not the means to a goal, he is the goal. He's not the end to a certain result, he is the result. And, and so what Jesus was doing was helping them think through that and begin to see Jesus exactly for who he is. Now, the, the people, the, the crowds, uh, the, the folks in general, they had a, a wrong impression of the Messiah uh, altogether, really, because they saw the Messiah as a political king, one who would come and make everything right, uh, get rid of all of the oppression of Rome, restore them back to their, uh, the nation back to its place of, of national prominence, worldwide prominence, and that the focus would be all about Israel again and about them as a Hebrew people, and, and life was going to change for them uh, in a very, very good way. But they saw, saw the Messiah as a political king, not necessarily as a personal spiritual king. In other words, they saw the Messiah as one who was going to do something for them. Again, they saw the Messiah as an end to, as, excuse me, as a means to an end, not as the end to himself. Now, obviously, the Messiah was going to do a lot of things, and the Messiah was going to change things, but the focus they had was not on who is the Messiah and seeing him for who he is, but what he could do for them, what he could accomplish for them. And it comes back to that saying, is it, is it about me, or is it about Jesus? And at this point, it would be good to ask that question uh, that your uh, teaching transcript has. It says, what about you? Do you ever fall in the trap of seeing Jesus as a means to the end instead of the end itself? What are some common ways this seemed to happen? And, and you know, we are no different in the 21st century as they were in the first century. We still fall into that same trap. Oftentimes today, we can see uh, people even making appeals to be a follower of Jesus based on what Jesus can do for you, not 
being a follower of Jesus based on who he is. He's the King of Kings. He's the Lord of Lords. He is the Messiah. He is God. And we are to follow him because of who he is, not necessarily because of what he can do for us. Now, being a follower of Jesus, there's some promises that he gives us and some things that God promises to do for us and, and that he will carry out in our lives. But the end is, he is not the means to a certain end. He is the end. He is who it is all about. And there's a, as your transcript says, there's a big difference between desiring the shepherd and desiring the grass or the water he can give. And I think your folks are going to come up with many examples of how we see that happening in our lives today, how we see Jesus as a means to an end instead of being the end itself. And I would, I would challenge you to, to take some minutes and just kind of talk through those uh, and, and to expose the fallacies of those, uh, to expose the, the, the uh, shallowness of those things, the emptiness of those, because if we make Jesus the means to an end, and those are the things we end up with, what do we have? What do we ultimately have? Instead, we see Jesus as the end, and we're with him, then what we find out is we don't need anything else. He is enough because he is Jesus. He is our king. He is our Lord. He is our Savior. He is God. And on page six, you see that there, there's a question that helps us with that. It says, we must start to see the, our statement, it says, we must start to see the person of Jesus as the ultimate goal of our lives, not a means to a greater end. And what we're talking about doing here is helping us to get to the point where we, we, we don't see Jesus, we, where we see Jesus not as someone to be used, but we see Jesus as God to be worshipped, to, to serve, to follow to live for him. See, we, we've we got to stop using Jesus. That's, that's a great statement there. We can't use him, by the way. You don't use God. You don't make God someone for you to use. You may try to do that, but you can't use him. And when you try to do that with God, then you're going to come up missing, missing it all together. You're going to be missing what life with God is all about because it's not about me and it's not about you. It is all about Jesus. Um, there's a question, a couple of questions for you to ask here. It says, if we just want Jesus so that, and you can answer that question, should we really think we understand who he is any more than those mixed up folks in Caesarea Philippi? And how can you start to tell in your own life that you're no longer seeing Jesus as a means to an end? And that's a really good question to, for your small group to start wrestling with and for your small group to start answering. And may, by the way, you may need to start with yourself. As a teacher, as a facilitator, uh, you may need to start uh, by answering that question for yourself and uh, share maybe some of that with your small group uh, as y'all work your way through this lesson or come to the end of it there. Uh, you know, the disciples got it right about who Jesus was, no doubt about it. They said, you know, you are Jesus, you are Christ the Lord, the, the Messiah, you're the Son of the living God. So they got it they got it right. But when you read through the rest of that passage, you find out that even though they got it right in giving that answer, how that was to be carried out, they struggled with. Because in the following passage, basically Jesus starts telling them that he's got to go to Jerusalem and that he's going to be crucified. He's going to be mistreated. He's going to be killed. He's going to die there. Peter pulls him aside and basically tries to straighten him out and says, wait a minute, Jesus, that's not the way the Messiah is going to come. That's not the work that the Messiah is going to do. That's now not how it's supposed to happen. And it was based on how Peter understood and wanted the Messiah to be instead of who the Messiah really is. Uh, there's a statement there in your lesson on page six that's important. It says, when we come to know Jesus for who he is, we, don't, we oftentimes really don't understand how he is going to be who he is. And so what we do is we make that the way we want him to be instead of the way that he has chosen to reveal himself and to carry out um, who he is as our king and as our Lord and as our Savior. 
Um, the final little uh, paragraph there is really important because it focuses in on what we've talked about previously, that when we come to understand who Jesus is, that he's not an end to a me, a means to an end, but he is the end, then we know that he is enough. And our focus is on him, then we don't see, then we don't need to be, uh, that we don't seek to try to make him being someone who, who provides for us what we want and the way we want it. In fact, we come to him, and because of who he is, that's all we need. We find out it's enough. We don't need uh, some of those other things we think we have to have. And so the closing question is this. Uh, who do you say that he is? And then you move into the application. Uh, the application uh, moment's a very important time because it's there where you start to take what you've learned and make it personal. And here is some uh, suggestions for you on that, that application moment, getting into these small groups or small, uh, smaller groups than your own small group. Maybe if you have a group of, of over 10 people, then you divide up into groups of two or three people each or, uh, and uh, get into those little cluster groups and then begin to deal with the handout section. The handout section's on page, or uh, small group handouts on page nine and has... Uh, some questions for your those groups, cluster groups to talk through, to think through together. And the last question uh, is a really good one because it go it 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 challenges you to think through the fact that Jesus is enough, that you can trust him, and you can just come to him and to him alone, worship him, put your faith in your and your trust in him. And, and not see him as a means to getting something else, but see him as the ultimate goal of your life and, look, and, and challenge the group to make sure they look at uh, discussion point number four, and especially read those pa uh, that passage that follows that from Matthew 6. Well, uh, page eight has the conclusion, which basically just wraps it up making the statement that Jesus is enough. He is our shepherd. He is our king. He's everything. And when we see him for who he is as that, as our shepherd, as our king, as our Lord, then he really is enough. You're going to have a great time teaching, facilitating uh, this lesson this week. Uh, I'm just praying for every one of you that as you go through this lesson, you find the truth that's there in the scriptures. You see it getting applied to your lives. How God is going to change you and change you in a way that's for our, your good, for his ultimate glory. Have a great time studying together. And uh, it is going to be a really neat month or so going through this series called Songs and Sayings. God bless. Mm -hmm.